And so back then, what were you doing? Were you investing in companies or? Yes, all my life I essentially spent uh, trying to identify unusual investment opportunities and uh, managing people's money. So this is my main activity. I've never done anything else. I had investments that involved me in doing other things, but uh, all my life it was about investing money. Mm -hmm. Were you the one responsible of doing everything, which means like the marketing of your company and, and investing as well, or did you have a, a team of people? I did everything myself, but of course I had supporting staff uh, to do the back office functions and I had some salesmen uh, who covered other clients than mine or they brought clients to the company and they managed uh, their accounts and so forth. But basically, uh, if you run a small business, you do a lot of things yourself. I mean, you develop the product, you develop the ideas and you market the ideas. Uh, the marketing was more through my newsletters. I have two reports. Uh, a website report that goes out by email every month and I have a printed report, the gloom, boom and doom report that goes out uh, in a printed form, as sent out by letter. I guess back then you didn't have that, when you began the... the... I started writing very early uh, because I disagreed with most of the research that okay. my firms or Wall Street produced, I thought they always want to be optimistic and always uh, ask people to buy things and I disagreed frequently with their views. So I started writing already in the 70s. One of the reasons I succeeded reasonably well already at the beginning is that when I was in New York, uh, it was the year 1970, 71, and there were always rumors and fears that the U.S. would devalue uh, the U.S. dollar because at the time, 1970, the U.S. dollar was grossly overvalued against the DM, the Deutsche Mark, and the Swiss franc, and other European currencies. And uh, one weekend in the summer of 71, I think it was early August, I wrote a report, not a long report, but a short report, why and how Europeans and foreigners could hedge against a devaluation of the dollar. So that in the US, hardly anyone paid attention to exchange rates. For them, the dollar was a dollar. Even today, for most Americans, they don't understand what foreign exchange is. So I wrote a report how to protect yourself, and I said you have to buy stocks in the US that will go up if the dollar is devalued, because they be, these companies become more competitive. Anyway, I sent this report out to all the offices of white wealth around the world. And over the weekend, the dollar was devalued. Uh, that was the Nixon uh, devaluation in 71. And so when I came to the office the next day, the whole investment committee of white wealth was around my desk waiting for me. And they said, how did you know that this would happen? I said, I didn't know, but it's likely that it would happen. Anyway, so uh, that gave me a boost in that company and they trusted my judgment about currencies. And how did you learn these things? Is this something that you had a passion for and you, you learned all by yourself or did you go through a course or you had any mentors well, along the, the way? the thing is I went to uh, university and first in Zurich and studied economics. I didn't study very much because at the time I was in the Swiss ski club, a uh, ski uh, racing club. Uh, ski team mm. and so I was all winter long racing uh, on alpine races but I went to some courses and we had in Zurich at the time two or three professors that were world famous one was called Haller and he had uh, provided the intellectual background 
or the theoretical background why a value-added tax was an extremely fair tax yeah, as a measure to raise revenues for the government. And so I studied financial fiscal policies under him. And he had also written two books, uh, fiscal policies, and one about taxes. Because when you raise taxes or you lower tax, uh, if I raise taxes on you, it's not sure that you will pay the tax under some conditions you can roll it over to somebody else. Like, I raise sales tax, the department store may be able to roll over either most of it or some of it to the consumer, to buyers of products in the department store. Anyway, so it's a complex matter. And the other professor, he was a, more of a macroeconomic historian uh, Lutz, and he had argued uh, for many years about flexible exchange rates, because at the time uh, there was still the agreement of Bretton Woods in place, which fixed the exchange rates between the dollar and other currencies, and the mechanism uh, that was applied was essentially to settle everything in gold. It was not the pure gold standard, but the gold-linked standard. So my professor had always argued for flexible exchange rates, which have a huge advantage. They have some disadvantages, but in general, they impose some discipline on countries. And so when I went to New York, I had a reasonably good uh, macroeconomic background. And also the, the thesis I wrote, the PhD I took, was about essentially fiscal policy, because when Robert Peel introduced the income tax in 1842, he repealed uh, import duties. So there was a shortfall in revenues for the government, but that was offset by the introduction of the income tax. And then when I was on Wall Street, I attended various courses and I became interested in technical analysis. And I met most of the great technicians at that time. And uh, I became interested uh, or more interested in economic history. So I also met some professors in economic history. And I mean, uh, you know, you can see my library. I have a, a vast uh, collection of economic books, the classical economic books, and some first editions and so forth. So I think, yes, I studied a lot later as, as I worked, because I was interested in economics, and I was interested in trying to make an honest buck. <laughs> so you were combining technical analysis and kind of the fundamentals, the macroeconomic. Yes, I look at both. I mean, if I see a chart that looks interesting for either a sector or for a company, then I ask myself, why is the stock uh, or the sector breaking out on the upside or on the downside? Is there, a re there must be a reason, either improving fundamentals or deteriorating fundamentals. And then I look for the fundamentals. Equally, I may get a report by some service provider that recommends a company and before I go into the details, I look at the chart, whether the chart looks attractive or not. So it's a combination of both.